special Throwback Thursday for you this week. Kirk Martin from Celebrate Calm is here with us, and we're going to show you his teaching from our parenting conference that he led. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Kirk's message. So tonight, here's what we're going to focus on, us. We're going to focus on my two main goals for this weekend. One, I want to give you tools to teach your kids so that they can control themselves. See, the best discipline is not you sending your kids to a room, it's your children having self-discipline, right? So we'll get to that tomorrow. Tonight, we're going to do the harder thing, which is changing us and breaking generational patterns. My dad was career military. He was known in our family as the colonel. So it was a lot of fun growing up. And so when I grew up, it was a lot of fear and intimidation around our house. So guess what happens? I had three brothers. So the four of us grow up. We get married, start having kids. Guess what we did? Same thing that my dad did. So every night we come home from work. You know what? Why are the Legos all over the floor? Why don't you ever pick anything up? And I, my family had to walk on eggshells around me because they didn't know how I was going to react when things went wrong. I put my wife in a really horrible position because I would come home and start getting on Casey about things because that's what I thought discipline was, yelling at your kids, because that was what my dad did to us. And I put my wife in the position of this. Do I stand up for my child and protect him? But if I do that, now I'm undermining my husband's authority. And that's a horrible place for a, a, a wife to be in. So I spent the first nine and a half years trying to change Casey. And I'd go for walks and talk to God and be like, why'd you give us this child? Why can't you just change Casey? And I started hearing these three, still little voice, three little questions in my brain. Number one, what if your son is made like this on purpose? Second question, what if by trying to change your son, you're frustrating my purposes for your son? That'll hit you. So now you're realizing you're messing with a plan. Third question, what if instead of trying to change your son, you're the one who needs to change? And I blocked that voice out because I thought that was from the devil. Because I'm a man. Because I'm like many of the men in here, I'm a guy, right? I don't have issues because a lot of guys do denial, right? I'll get the ones like, I don't have anger issues, clearly, right? And we do, we get that from our, right? It comes down. And so I changed and I found that the more that I changed, the more my son changed. And so I believe the greatest gift that I've given my son is breaking that generational pattern that I got from my dad who got it from his dad and his dad. Everybody in here has patterns. Some of the uh, wives in here, some of the moms, you're really, really sweet. But you had that mother who was like the martyr mother who did everything for everybody else and nothing for herself, right? And you'll hear yourself saying things like, after all I do for you. You know whose issue that is? Yours. Because nobody's demanding that you do that. Your kids are never going to wake up and say, Mom, listen, how to talk with my brother, we've decided you do too much for us. Right? They're not going to do that. If people are taking advantage of you, it might be something inside of you. Right? Those of you who married a controlling man, it's not all the controlling man. There's something inside of you that drew that person to you. Right? We all, it's no blame and no guilt in any of this. It's simple realization of we all have generational patterns. And parenting... I think it's partly marriage and parenting are God's way of either causing us to grow apart or grow up, right? Because that's what happens. And if you have a strong-willed child, it just means that God entrusted you with a very tough kid who's going to rule the world one day. So and you're going to have uh, friends around you who have both have little compliant kids, and they're going to judge you. But it's like God knew that they weren't very mature people, so he gave them easy ones to handle. So... <laughs> I'm kidding, but it just works out that way. So, first principle we always talk about. There's one person in life that you can control, and that is whom? Ourselves. How many of us struggle with that? How many of us ever tell, tell our kids, you need to calm down and get control of yourself? Anybody ever do that? Anybody do that tonight before the conference, right? I'm going to the parent calm conference. You need to settle down. And your kids are like, Mom, Dad, I hope this is a four-week conference because we need some help with that. Now, I believe this to be true. The quickest way to change your child's behavior is to first control your own. Quickest way, by the way, the quickest way to change your spouse's behavior, and we'll do this tomorrow in the little spouse's section, marriage section, is to control your own behavior. It's a fascinating, fascinating thing. You'll see by the end of this, it makes sense. Quickest way to change your child's behavior is to first control your own. Look, if you um, come up to a strong-willed child like this, 
what are you going to get? Power struggle, right? All this says is, oh, apparently you want to fight, bring it, right? <laughs> so if I come up to, um, is this going to work with the camera or is it going to really mess you up? Like, uh, just got to, if I come up to this gentleman like this, what are we going to have? We're going to have a confrontation. He's a big, strong-looking dude. I'm not an idiot, okay? So if I have to have words with him, now what are we having? A conversation, not a confrontation. So two things to begin with I'd work on and watch, especially with a strong-willed child. We're going to talk about body posture and tone of voice, and these things are critical. So this will sound funny and dumb, but it works. So we had all these kids in our home, and I started to discipline kids. Look, here's normal discipline. I come home from work frustrated, and I start walking around like this because there's stuff all over the place, and I need you to get ready, and I need you to do these things. When I'm in this kind of mode, I just want to bark out orders, right, and start yelling at kids. So I began to discipline all the kids who came in our home same way. I'd sit, and I'd discipline like this. And I did it for two reasons. One, it freaks kids out. They have no idea what to do with you when you're sitting down. But the real reason was this. Watch what I'm communicating. I'm in complete control of myself. My yes is my yes. My no is my no. I'm not going to repeat things 14 times. I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to scream and yell. I'm in control of myself. So let me give you a practical example, and you're going to think it's funny or stupid, but try it. The next time your kids are squabbling with you, Next time you're having a little sibling fight going on in the living room, walk into the living room and lie down in the middle of the living room floor. <laughs> Try it sometime. Because those two kids who are squabbling with each other, they're going to stop. You know why? Because they're going to look over at you like, what's my mother doing <laughs> laying down in the middle of the floor? And you take back control of that situation, not by controlling their behavior, but by controlling yours. Now, let's do this in context of a sibling example. I'm just going to pick on you two because you sat up front. So, what's your name if you don't mind? Christian. Christian? Good name. I'm not going to ask you. It's okay. I just want to, because I'm going to yell at him because he's a man. Um, so, <clears throat> there's my son and my daughter, okay? Typical situation. If you have a handout, if you don't mind, if you got one of our uh, Celebrate Calm handouts, uh, open it up. Second page, you'll see a chart with three columns. So, Typically what happens in this situation is, um, so in the third column of that chart, if you see that chart with three columns, a lot of your strong-willed kids have brains, they don't get enough dopamine or blood flow, so the brain is physiologically understimulated. Mm -hmm. So they're always looking for stimulation. By the way, it's why they argue with you. It's why they pick on their siblings. It's why they procrastinate. It's why they fidget all the time. That's why they do all those things in that third column are related to a brain that needs to be stimulated. So my son Christian is bored this afternoon, but he needs his brain stimulated, so he decides to poke his sister, or better, almost poke her without actually touching her because that's ir more irritating, or he looks at her. And she says, Mom, Dad, Christian, my brother's irritating me, so what do we usually do? Mom usually comes into the room, you know what, Christian? Guys, after all I do for you, I buy you all these toys, all these video games, you can't even play well together for 20 minutes. You know what? If you can't play well, you go to your room, you go to your room, right? And inadvertently, what I just did, did with the kids, and watch, let me finish it and I'll come back. Now, what happens? Mom's yelling, dad gets upset. Why does dad get upset? Because his wife is upset and we have no clue what to do with you when you're upset. <laughs> True? And it freaks men out. So you know what we're really saying? Christian, I don't care if you pick on your sister. Do not make my wife upset, because I don't know what to do with that. And so, so watch what happened. One child, by looking at his sister, got three people in the home all wound up. Whose issue is that? Not his, it's yours, and it's hers. True? No blame, no guilt, but you got to own your stuff, okay? I want to write a book one day called Own Your, you know what, stuff, right? I want a politician at some point. I will vote for the first politician who admits the reason I didn't get elected is because I'm untrustworthy and unlikable. And I'll be like, you got it now. I'll vote for you, okay? 
So, one kid does that, and inadvertently, when I come down and just start yelling at Christian, you know what inadvertently I teach him? If you want your brain stimulated, just do something negative because then you get all of my intensity. By the way, it's not attention. Your kids don't want your attention. They want your intensity because the brain is drawn to intensity, and what they learn very quickly is the quickest way for someone to get intense in my home is for me to do something wrong. Right? By the way, I could do a little aside. For the men out there, please don't get freaked out. Every dad, it's like comes with the dad parenting thing. It's this one. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me when I'm talking to you. Every man thinks if his child isn't looking at him, it's disrespect. It's right? True? Okay. So we do this. Oh, look at me. Look at me. Part of the reason they're not looking is usually a lot of kids that we work with, they think best when they're not looking an adult in the eyes. And I know you're going to oh, that's an excuse. It's not. They're sensory kids, and they think best when they have their eyes closed, when they're looking away. That's why in school sometimes, and I'll do this tomorrow, they actually do better when they're looking out the window, when they're looking down. They process stuff better. And the other reason they don't want to look you in the eyes is because the only time you ever look them in the eyes is when they're in trouble. So it's a fear thing because nobody, dad ever comes in, Christian, look at me, look at me, just made a good choice. I'm proud of you. Like nobody does that. <laughs> but I want you to start doing that because your kids will seek this positive intensity from you when you give it to them. So I just taught him something negative, and I just taught my daughter kind of a victim, right? Because like the whole, this whole issue was your brother's, but it's not because she has, she has the choice of whether she reacts to it or not right? So let's rewind the situation. Instead, they're squabbling. Mom comes into the living room, lies down in the middle of the floor. For the moms in here, sometimes it's kind of nice because you haven't been able to sit down since you had kids, <laughs> right? So take advantage of it. By the way, sorry for the asides, but I just try to roll with what pops in my mind sometimes. For the moms out there uh, who do too much for your kids, you've got to break that pattern. So here's a good one. One night this weekend or next week, I want you to sit on the sofa, right? Because usually it's that evening time, right? Especially during the week, you're doing everything for your kids. Sit, start reading something you want to read. Not a parenting book, not something for your kids. Read something you want to read. And when your kids come in the room, Mom, Mom, I'm hungry. I want to eat. You can say, hey, you've got two legs and two feet. You can go to the kitchen, get yourself a snack. And while you're there, I would like a snack and a glass of iced tea. And what you will have just demonstrated is that your time's important and that you were worthy of your kids waiting on you sometimes. Because the reason, if I can go a little harsh, it's this. For some of us in here, the reason your kids don't respect you is because you don't respect yourself. The reason your kids don't respect your time is because you don't respect your own time, because you do everything for everybody else and nothing for yourself. And it sounds like it's very virtuous, and it's not, because Jesus didn't even do that. Hey, Jesus, my brother's dying. Lazarus is dying. Yeah, I think I'll hang out here for a few days. Every mom in here would have been like, oh, is he sick? Let me make him some soup. I'll make him organic soup, and then I'll take it to him, and I'll wait on him, and I'll serve him, and give, give, give. Jesus did not do that. He retreated often to the mountains so that he could reconnect and connect with his father so that then he could give out. Does that make sense? Jesus did not run around like a, a madman like modern-day parents do trying to satisfy everybody. True? If my, I always make this joke. I hope it's okay. But like if but Jesus were like a modern-day parent, especially a mom, he would have been running around frazzled, and then he'd be up on the cross like, see, see what you did to me, <laughs> right? He would have been doing like a big guilt trip. But he didn't do that. So moms, I want you to take some time for yourselves and demonstrate self-respect. You can't demand respect from another human being. You have to demonstrate self-respect. Let me do it in two ways here, two ways of saying this. I'm going to do the harsh one first. If you don't care enough about yourself to take care of yourself emotionally, physically, and spiritually, why would anybody else care about you? You run around without regard to your own emotional, physical, um, emotional health, and you're demonstrating that you're not worthy of someone treating you well because you don't treat yourself well. Some things in here, 
I did a thing for social workers this afternoon in Johnson County. And social workers, if there are any in here, are very, very, very giving people, but they tend to not take care of themselves. And so I asked them, I said, you'll do anything for your client and if your clients, if anyone treated your client the way you treat yourself, you'd be furious at them. Some of it's a worthiness issue. And you're going to have to deal with that on a deep level of knowing I'm worthy. This is not pride, okay? I'm worthy of having people serve me sometimes. Because some of you, some of the moms in here, you have a hard time asking for help. Oh, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. And I want you to let people serve you sometimes because they'll begin to respect you because you demonstrate self-respect. Here's the nice way of saying it. The greatest gift I give my family is not what I do for, my, not what I do for them, is what I do for myself. As you can probably tell, I'm kind of a sarcastic jerk by nature. My nature is I'm kind of a jerk. It is. And so I spend a lot of time on self-care. I work out almost every single day because I have to sweat off my jerkiness right? And when I go for my morning walks, when I walk alone, because I'm not good at praying, sitting, kneeling and praying, I fall asleep. And so I go for walks and I talk to God. And the gift to my family is when I walk through the door of my home, now my wife and kids don't have to manage my emotions for me because I already did it. And so when I walk in through that door, I don't need you to manage my anxiety because I took care of that in the gym. Now when you're having a bad day, I can deal with it. And when you're in a bad mood, I don't have to fix that mood because I can deal with it and say, honey, for the men out here, it's all you have to do. Totally get why you're frustrated. And then zip, don't say another word. <laughs> oh, honey, there's no need to be upset. You're just overreacting. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Where are you sleeping tonight, right? <laughs> so take that self-care thing very seriously. Christians hear it as being selfish, but it's not. If you study the life of Jesus, you'll see that he took really good care of himself because he knew his mission on earth was to give out to other people, but you can't do it if you're exhausted in every way. So now I walk in the living room, and I lie down on the floor, and they stop and look over like, what are you doing? Now I have a chance to teach. Discipline means, literally means to teach. It's from the word disciple. How do you disciple someone? By talking to them all the time? Best way is by living out your life in front of them. Discipline is not punishment. It's not consequences. It's teaching. So now watch. I've got an opportunity to teach. Because they're going to be like, what are you doing? Uh, just observing. Look, I know what's about to happen here. So Christian, here's what's going on. You've got this really cool brain, right? It's like uh, really, really, really busy. How many of you have kids with busy brains? They're thinking all the time, right? And so when things feel like that's out of your control, you try to control other people at times, but you've got this busy brain that needs to be stimulated. So when you get bored, you pick on your sister. A couple issues with that. One is when you pick on your sister, you just lose all your stuff. And two, it makes you weak because you need her to react. Because if she doesn't react, you've got to up your game, and then you're going to lose everything you own. So here are two other things I know about you. You love money. How many of you have kids who love money? And I don't mean in a bad way. They're just really drawn to it. Good. You know what I mean. It's a, it's a good thing. They, they, they're naturally gravitate toward it. And I will tell you, most of those kids, the other trait that I know is they have big hearts. Never toward you, but toward other people. True? So Christian, you really like money and you like helping other people. So you've got an option here. And watch the tone of voice. I'm talking to them. Instead of, you know what? Why can't you guys ever get along or doing the mommy thing? You know, you guys are going to be best friends one day. La, 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 la. No, they're not. Are you best friends with your siblings? No. That's why, sibling, that's why visit, family visits are short. So anyway, you know what I mean. So look, now I have a chance to teach. Say, look, I'm giving you a couple options. If you want to spend your whole childhood just irritating your sister, you're going to be miserable. But look, I bet we could come up with three or four different ways for you to earn some money in the neighborhood, right? Because some of you have kids, any of you have kids, this is a weird one, that love, would love to like shovel mulch or do heavy work like that. It's weird, but use that to your advantage. Your kids can get jobs in the neighborhood, raking leaves, walking dogs, they can make a lot of money from that. So if you want to start making some money, I will match whatever you give to St. Jude's to help those kids with cancer. And I'm showing him a different way 
to stimulate his brain that's positive. Does that make sense? But it's using his strengths. Now with my daughter, I can say, honey, listen, I get it. Your brother's irritating. Welcome to life. He's been irritating since he was in my womb, right? (laughs) But if all you're ever going to do in life, look, when we do this stuff with our kids, we make them a victim. Honey, I'm sorry. Sorry, he's your brother. Listen, your childhood's going to be miserable until he goes off to college or jail. Sorry, (laughs) right? And I'm not doing that. So, honey, here's the deal. People are irritating in life. If all you're ever going to do in life is, is react to irritating people or situations, you're going to be miserable in life, and I can't help you with that. But if you want to learn how to react, respond to your brother instead of react to him, oh, I can show you three different ways to do that. But you have a choice in the matter. Right? Does that make sense? And I'm teaching her instead of just getting all frustrated. So try it sometime, the body posture. Just watch. It's really, really cool. Um, Let me do this one, and then I'll come to tone of voice. For the men in here, I like to use analogies with men just so you kind of get the concept. Men in every sphere of life respect other men who stay calm and cool under pressure. Like in the middle of a war, you don't want your platoon captain saying, oh my gosh, they're shooting at us. Nobody's following that guy. March Madness is coming up, right? And at the end of a game, the end of a game, close game, they're going to interview the winning team. Man, how'd you guys win out that, win, win that, pull out that game? They never said, man, we just freaked out at the end. They always say the same exact words. We just stayed calm and played our game. Super Bowl's coming up, right? A good quarterback. Okay, let's say that the, uh, uh, let's say San Francisco gets off to a lead. Okay? If Patrick Mahomes comes in the huddle, you know what? We're down by two touchdowns. You don't know what route to run. You keep fumbling the ball. Nobody's following that quarterback. But he's going to come in the huddle, watch the body posture, takes a knee. Guys, we're down by two touchdowns. We've got them right where we want them. Just what we did with the Titans. Just what we did, right? What we did to everybody. We're going to march down the field. We're going to execute our plays. We're going to score, get the ball back, and score again, probably in like a minute and eight seconds. So, (laughs) right? And his team follows him. Look, when you guys were down, who was it you were down three touchdowns to? Uh, 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 Texans. You didn't see Patrick Mahomes over there like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? And his team comes into the huddle and follows him because, you know, you can't, he's, right? He's unflappable. So for the men in here, especially if you have little kids, Sometimes, instead of coming home all frustrated from work and flailing about, come in, take a knee. Call your kids, because little kids are drawn to people who sit. It's really cool. On church on Sunday, go out there and just sit in the middle. Go to a mall, sit in the middle of the floor. You will have like 15 kids (laughs) sitting around you. Because when you sit, says, I've got time for you. And I'm not going to... So you come in and take a knee, your kids come, and then you say, guys, here's the deal, Christian, here's the deal, son, daughter, we've got a busy night tonight. You and I, we're going to get started on dinner. Mom and daughter, take care of that. We'll meet back here at 554, then we're taking off. See, they'll follow you when you're in control of yourself. But if I just come in, you know what? We're always late. You have stuff all over. You never do this. Your kids don't want to follow you because all they know is you're going to flip people off in traffic, right? How many of you Sunday morning's the worst morning of the whole week? How many of you yell at your kids the entire way to church, right? And then you get there. You will be on your best behavior. We are going in to worship Jesus, right? And you're like, but you just flip people off in the parking lot because we're running late. For whatever reason, Sunday morning's awful. We taught in a, mo- in a mosque, a uh, Muslim, and we, uh, in one week last year, we did a mosque, a synagogue, and a Christian church. And what I found out, here's what all three faiths have in common. Parents yell at their kids on the morning of their worship. So the Jewish people do it on Friday, the Muslims on Saturday, and the Christians on Sunday. It's awesome. So, so do that. Watch the posture. Body, uh, let's do tone of voice. And this one's critical. Tone of voice, especially for your emotional kids, strong-willed children, even matter-of-fact tone. It's really more important than you can possibly imagine. So here's what we've kind of fallen into. A lot of modern-day parents, nothing wrong with this, but here's what they do. Sweetie, baby, mommy needs your help. And I don't like that sweetie baby thing, okay? (laughs) Nothing wrong with it, but here's what your kids hear. Sweetie, baby, 
you scare the crap out of me because everybody I tell you to do something, you have a big tantrum. So I think if I use a sing-songy mommy voice and I throw in scripture because maybe Jesus will help me with you, right? <laughs> All they hear, and I'm not being funny with this, they hear weakness and they hear it as condescending. And I really am not a big fan of referring to myself as mommy or daddy with a strong-willed child. They hear it as weakness. I'd rather you talk to your three-year-old, your 13-year-old, your 23-year-old like they're an adult. I know it sound, it'll sound to a lot of the moms in here, it will sound very cold, but it's not. It says, I'm in control. This really sweet, by the way, that really, really overly sweet sounds very patronizing. And when your kids are really upset and we do, oh, honey, it's okay. You know what it feels like, what they want to say? It feels like you're not taking me seriously. Does that make sense? Honey, it's okay. It's like the husband. Honey, it's okay. There's no need to be upset. He's trying to mollify you, and you're not taking it seriously. So if my seven-year-old is jumping on the sofa, I'm not coming in the room. Hey, buddy, you know what? There's springs in the sofa. We don't jump on the sofa. By the way, you don't have to do the we thing unless you're jumping on the sofa, okay? <laughs> I get it. Many of us grew up with very authoritarian parents like mine, and we didn't want to be authoritarian, but we've gone too far the other way, and we're a little bit too egalitarian. So right in the middle, so when I come into the room, it may sound like this. Hey, jumping on the sofa, not happening in my home. But I love your energy. If you want to come help me stir the soup, walk the dog, I'm all over that. So break this down. When I come in the room, I'm in control of myself. Not do I, how many times do I have to tell you, uh, they don't care. Don't talk about your childhood. When I was a kid, all it says is you're old, yeah. right? <laughs> so, so when I come in the room and I say, hey, jumping on the sofa, not happening in my home. Here's why I like it. It's a statement of fact, but it's not personal. Why do you always jump on it? Why can't you? There's nothing personal. I'm letting you know how I roll in my home. Here's how I roll. Jumping on a sofa, not happening. I like it because it's short and sweet. We get in trouble when we talk way too much. The more words you use, the less valuable they become. And it just becomes Charlie Brown's teacher. And that's all they end up hearing. Short and sweet says I'm in control of myself and I've got authority, right? Jumping on a sofa, not happening in my home. I don't know, whatever words you want to use. I, I had 1,500 kids in my home, so I got very short. Hey, not happening. I said other things, too, that I can't say here, but uh, I was before I was kind of saved in uh, parenting. So, uh, no, not really. I just, you know what my phrase was? Hey, cut the crap. And for some reason, that really worked. I don't know why, but it really worked. I'm not advocating that one. Now, here's the other part. So when you go no, and we're going to do a whole thing on discipline tomorrow. When I say no, there's no energy in it. I'm not going to give energy. I'll give you a quick one. My, you're going to be my stand-in, my teenage daughter. I'm mom, teenage daughter, okay? Teenage daughter's mouthing off. She's rolling her eyes, right? All those things. Rather react to it, I'm going very, I like a very kind of low key. So, honey, here's the deal. You may continue to talk to me like that. You may continue to roll your eyes with me. I don't need you to respect me because I've got something called self-respect. So if you're going to talk to me like that, but then you're going to expect me, especially in the winter, every night to get out of my warm house, go out to the car, and take you to an extracurricular that costs way too much and you're not even good at, not happening anymore. <laughs> I'm kidding. Leave that. That's just sarcasm. You can think it. Don't say it, okay? <laughs> you will crush your child. I thought you said I had a good singing voice. Not really. <laughs> God loves your voice, but I don't. So anyway, but you know what? Leave that part out, but I'm just, you got to use humor. It's Friday night, people are tired. So that's self-respect, but I'm not making, how dare you talk to me? I can't believe that you would talk. We create all this drama. I don't need drama. I'm just letting you know. Let me follow this one through, and I'll probably do it again tomorrow. I'm out of order here. But look, I don't need you to respect me. I have self-respect. The reason I want you to respect me, it's not for me. I don't need, some of this is going to bother you. I don't need you to respect me right? I'm a grown adult. Does God need you to respect him? Is he up there like, I can't believe after all I've done for them, they don't respect me. Ugh. <laughs> True? Sometimes you know what's really helpful for parenting is to imagine how God deals with it as a parent. Because then you realize like, oh, I'm kind of petty. He's not, right? 
By the way, can I be honest? Stop taking everything personally. I wish I could swear sometimes. Sometimes I do wish I could swear because it, it, I do in my personal prayer time. I do because it adds some intensity to it. I hope you're not offended by that, but I swear some because it adds some intensity to it, and I'm an intense person, and it adds something. You're the freaking, sorry, you're the freaking grown-up. You're the grown-up. I know, but my nine-year-old's really tough. I know he is, but you're 35. There's two of you. You have like 80 years of experience, and you're being owned by a five-year-old, right? True? Stop taking it so personally. What if God did that? All he'd be doing is like, can't believe that they did that. Don't you love me? Right? He doesn't do guilt trips like we do. I gave my son and that's how you treat me. Right? Because he knows that we're weak and we're clay. Right? And your kids are broken. You're all bro- we're all broken. That's why I want you to have mercy on each other in your marriage. Right? You're all broken. We're all broken people. We'll get into that with the marriage. It's really good. So, look, the reason, I don't need you to respect me. I'm a grown adult. You're a terrible parent. Oh, my life is going to crumble. Oh, she called me. A t- I didn't look for my, to my son for validation. True? I'm the adult, adult. I told my son when he was 13, I was like, here's my expectation during your, your teen years. You're not going to like my voice. You're not going to like anything I tell you. I don't need you to like it, and I don't need you to like me. I just simply expect you to do what I told you to do. You can have a bad attitude. If you're outside raking the leaves and you're miserable, I'll pop some popcorn and pull up a lawn chair and watch you be miserable. I don't need you to have a good attitude. I just expect you to do what I want. I don't always have a good attitude either, okay? Sometimes God asks us to do stuff. I don't always like, yes, sir, I'm really pleased. No, I'm grumbling. It's stupid. Why'd you ask me to do that? Duh. I don't want to do it. If I do it, right? So, Look, there's a lot of stuff in there about stop controlling other people's moods. Well, kids, you need to be grateful. How many wives in here like it when your husband comes home and you had a bad day and he says, oh, honey, there's no need to be upset. You just need to be grateful. Really? I don't want to control my mood. Sometimes I want to be in a bad mood. True? Just give me some space, right, to work through my mood without you standing over me, lecturing and throwing scripture at me, in all things give thanks. Oh, you know what I'm thankful for? That you're leaving right now because you're irritating me, right? (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Don't use scripture as a bludgeon for your kids because they'll end up hating it, right? Because we use scripture sometimes for our own purposes. And, And yes, for my own, to use as a bludgeon against people Right? Anyway, we'll get to that. So, ugh, I hope you'll have me back tomorrow. So, <laughs> look, so the reason I want you to respect me, it's not for me. It's for you. Because I, when I know when kids respect their parents, things go better with them. And I know that you're 13, and you're going to want freedom to do birthday parties and sleepovers and get your driver's license. But, honey, every time you talk back and you roll your eyes at me, all it tells me is you're not mature enough to handle that freedom. And that makes me sad for you. So I'm not mad at you. I can take it. It's not going to affect my life. Your attitude affects your life, not mine. Does that make sense? Because I'm giving ownership to the child. Every time I come in and try to control them and all this stuff, I'm actually taking ownership for their choices. I want you to own that. It's not going to ruin my day. So where was I in this whole thing? I'm like four things apart from to thank you. That's pretty good. So tone of voice, really good. I like the even matter of fact tone of voice. Um, And then when we're not doing sweetie, watch. Here's what happens. When we're really sweet and then they don't do it, like in a half second, how many of us do this thing? You know what? You get a bet, get your little butt up in bed right now. How many of you do that? You go from like really sweet and then in a half second, you're like, you know what? I tried to be sweet. Now you're going to get devil mom, right? And now you go for it. But the problem with yelling it is this. Two things, and for the dads out here, two things. One, you can't intimidate a strong-willed child. By nature, they're fight-or-flight kids. And you come up to them and say, you know what, my way or the highway, they're going to be like, bring it. Bring it. 
Oh, you want to spank me? Fine, I'll go outside. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to break a branch off a tree, and I'm going to whittle on it for like an hour and a half. I'll make it nice and sharp. I will come in. They will pull their own pants down, bend over, hand Dad a little switch and say, have at it, Dad. And right in the middle of it, they'll say, Dad, you know what? Can't even feel it when you spank me. Might want to have Mom do it. They'll taunt you. How many of you have discovered that? Look, I'm not going to do a thing on spank because everybody gets all controversial about it. All I know for the strong-willed child is sometimes when you go really hardcore like that, it will drive the defiance so deep into them that every time you hit them, they will say, F you, F you, F you. So, it's not, so we're going to go a different way to handle that, but I just watch that whole thing. So I don't like the sweetie baby. I don't like the screaming and yelling. Right in between that is me in control of myself. It's me as the leader, and kids will follow you if you, if you leave. Does that make sense? So let's do a couple applications. It's one of my favorite ones. So one of the big triggers in our homes is, uh, how many of you, this is a big trigger for the men in here. When you hear your child yelling at your wife, right? Big trigger. So in this example, uh, Christian, you're going to be my son, and uh, you're going to be the mom, okay? I like picking on you. You have such a sweet face. Uh, I know at home you're probably not, but here, really <laughs> sweet face. So... So I walk into the room, and I hear my son yelling at my mother, and I come in, and I'm probably going to do this. And by the way, I want to make this clear. There's nothing wrong with most of what we're doing. For the men in here, you're justified in yelling at your kids sometimes. You're justified. But it doesn't mean that it's right or that it works well. Does that make sense? You're justified in being frustrated but I want what works. So I'd likely come in and say, Christian, hey, uh, how many times do I have to tell you you don't yell at your mother? And then that was my opportunity when Casey was little, launch into, you leave your stuff up all the time, never do the chores. And I said, you know what? Go to your room for the rest of the week, no video games, no food. Because I'm a man, <laughs> I give consequences I can't keep. How many of you do that one, right? How many of the men do this one? No video games the rest of the week while I'm away on a business trip. Now your mom has to deal with it. So, Now, I walk away thinking, I just stood up for my wife. And you know what she's thinking? No, you didn't. You just ruined the whole night. Because now I've got to spend two hours up in his room calming down our son who's crying, explaining that your father doesn't hate you. He just has some unresolved issues from childhood, right? <laughs> And now I get resentful. Why? Because I wouldn't have to yell at your son if you weren't so soft and let him get away with everything. Does that happen in the home? That's pretty common, right? So, and she's like, yeah, and you're a hard, right? Because that's the way it works in most homes. So that ends in all kinds of frustration. So let's look at a different way to handle this. So a couple little preambles before we do the example. One, before you discipline in this situation, you have to de-escalate. You've got to de-escalate the situation because what happens is we hear something going on and we're right on it, like right away. You know what? Stop, stop it. You better, right? And we're on it and that child's already really emotional. I'm emotional. Never good mix, right? And so what usually happened with Casey when he was little, I come in, you know what? You know what, Casey? You know what? One more word, young man. One more. And you know what? That was a cue for him to say, word, right? Because he was a very challenging kid, and he knew that would make me furious. So if you do the word, th one more word, you're asking for that. So I would keep up. You've heard this one, or you've done this one. You know, keep, keep it up. You already lost your video games for one week. You want to make it two, and your strong-willed child's going to be like, let's make it four. And inside, then you'll drop the F-bomb, like, why do we have kids, right? Because this is tough. How many of you occasionally drop F-bombs on your kids or when you're parenting? I'm just checking out the honesty. I like it. The rest of you are lying. So I'm just kidding. It's normal. Family life is supposed to be difficult. If it's difficult, you're normal. The we said that. The first family. This is before video games. The first kid murdered his brother. It's been awful since the beginning. So don't Look, the first thing, Adam, don't eat from the tree. He eats from the tree. Then what does he do? He blames his wife. This stuff is not new, right? So don't, it's not like it's like our modern day society. It's been horrible from the beginning because we're all flawed and broken. So 
I would do that whole thing and watch. This is going to sting a little bit. I like things to sting a little bit. I don't do blame or guilt, but I like it to sting a little bit. When I was doing that to my son, you know what I was doing? I was provoking him to anger. Because everybody quotes scripture and parenting. Kids, respect your parents. And nobody ever quotes fathers, mothers, do not provoke your children to anger. And we do it two ways. One, well, more than that. But part of it was when I was doing, you know, keep it up, young man, keep it up. I could see on his face when he was young, he was gone emotionally. You know what I'm saying? Eyes are all lit up, his face is all red, and I knew it. And I just keep going and keep going and do this, and I was escalating things, and I was provoking him to anger, and I didn't know at the time, you know why I did it? Because I eventually wanted him to say something really horrible, so when I walked back downstairs, I could tell my wife, do you hear what your son just said to me so I could justify it. But this is the part that's going to sting. Watch what was really happening. What I was really saying to my son was this. I need you to behave because if you don't behave and do what I tell you to do, I'm not sure I can behave. You do not want to see me angry. Does that make sense? That's what I was really saying. This just popped in my mind. This is a really deeper thing that I want you to wrestle with. I want you to wrestle with your view of God. Because there are people in here that my view of God was shaped by my father. My father never told me once he was proud of me. My dad was law. He's total law kind of guy. And so I've had to battle my whole life viewing God and understanding grace. Because it's never good enough for my dad. So if you're like that, I guarantee 30, 40% of you, maybe more, are. And so it's like, you never quite pray enough. You never quite do enough. You never quite do enough. And so you have that little thing in you that's like, God's never quite really pleased with you. That will bleed over into your parenting big time. Because you will, and I may do something on obedience tomorrow. Because that's a, a big code word for me when I hear it. Like, obedience. Usually it's someone who... and. Uh, Anyway, I'll save it for tomorrow, but a lot of times what I hear is very law-based parenting, and usually that's the way you view God. So I just encourage you to wrestle with that because it makes a huge difference in how you parent your kids because we tend to parent how we think God parents us. Does that make sense? It's a really interesting dynamic to wrestle with. So I was dependent on my son because I was saying, you need to behave or I'm going to lose it, right? I don't want that to happen because I want your kids to trust you and come to you. And underneath all of this, look, the reason I'm not a big fan of the word obedience is because I like the word trust better. I don't obey God because I'm afraid he's going to send me to some bad place. I listen to God because I trust him. It has a different feel to it, right? Because obedience is a little bit more of like I have to and it's a duty to do it. Trust is... I have a good father who believes the best and wants the best for me, and so therefore I can follow him and do what he says, not because I'm afraid of him, but because I trust that he's good to me. Does that make sense? And that's what I ultimately want in, for all of us, both in this way and then with our kids. And so the other, uh, watch the other provoking thing, and it's going to sting a little bit too, talking too much. Some of us talk way too much. I send out a, a newsletter every year, twice a year, and the subject line is, shut up. Because sometimes you have to get through to people. It's like, you're just talking too much. It's too, it's too many words. Like, stop, stop, stop. Just stop. Because that's provoking. Well, I, just, I, 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 I don't think you are. I, I just need to tell you one more time. And that's my own anxiety, right? So, so here's a different way to handle this. So we've got to de-escalate first. How do you de-escalate? The phrase that we use is motion changes emotion. So motion or movement is a tool to help a child calm down. And I'll show you why. Because many of us, we do way too many words. Honey, use your words. Use your words. And what your kids are thinking is, you don't want to hear my words right now because I'll get grounded for those words. You can't process language when you're upset. A little caveat here Sometimes modern day parents, we do that whole psychology thing of like, let's identify your emotions. Moms, you're having a bad day. You want your husband coming home saying, honey, let's identify your emotions. Do you want to talk? And she's like, uh, right now I'm identifying hatred for you, <laughs> right? Who wants to always point out your emotions? You know what I mean? Like in this moment, 
I don't need to know what his emotions are. I know. He's frustrated and he's angry. What I need to focus on is giving him tools to deal with the frustration and anger, not just talk about it. One other aside, my wife is a therapist. I believe in therapy. Some therapy is phenomenal. But sometimes it's really hurtful. And you've got to watch that because bringing a child in to talk to a therapist every week about anxiety will often kids talk, cause kids to have more anxiety. Let's talk about your anxiety. What? No. I'd rather, and some of you have need, your kids need that, so you're going to have to decide where that is. But what I'd rather do is normalize certain things. Of course you're anxious sometimes. It's a normal part of being human. We're making everything overly therapized these days, like, oh, well, I'm depressed. And some people have true depression. Some people, there's seven bad days or weeks or bad circumstances. But if you go and talk to someone, then you're going to walk out, your kids are going to walk out thinking, there's something wrong with me. And for most of your kids, there's nothing wrong with them. They just don't fit in or they're strong-willed, which definitely means they don't fit in because they're going to do everything opposite of the right way to do it in school and in society. And we'll get into that tomorrow of how to help these kids, but they feel like they're swimming upstream. And you're going to have to help with them, them with that. But anyway, there's my little aside with that. So I like the motion. Movement is a good thing. So let's do this example. So instead, I come into the room, and I come in with a little intensity. I like intensity with intense kids. Intensity plus intensity sometimes is very calming. Not intensity like, you better stop now, but intensity toward problem solving. So I come in the room. Hey, Christian, I can tell you're frustrated. Listen, I've got a football, nonverbal. When you're ready, if you want to come outside, I'll play catch with you, help you with whatever you're struggling with. Hey, Christian, I can tell you're upset. I'm going to dump some Legos on in the floor in the living room. When you're ready, if you want to come in, we'll build a really cool spaceship. Now let's break this down. I'm coming in with a little bit of intensity. I'm moving, and I'm getting him to move. I acknowledge right away, hey, get that you're frustrated. It's just a nice thing to acknowledge what you're going through. Don't spend a lot of time on it. I like nonverbals with strong-willed kids because uh, I'll give you two. The football thing I used in my house with those kids all the time because I didn't want to talk about their emotions. Uh, Casey, with his mom, had, uh, they, they always had this thing. If he drank coffee from a young age, I don't know why. He was a weird little kid, and he liked the caffeine. It was good for him because he's a really hyper kid, and it calmed him down. Um, but whatever. But, so he had a code word in middle school because most middle schoolers aren't going to come home and say, Mother, I had a really tough day at school. Would you like to talk to me? It's just odd. So he'd come home, and I bought them little um, Dunkin' Donuts uh, coffee mugs tiny little ones for a Christmas ornament. So he'd come home and, op and just hold up his coffee mug, and that meant I need to talk. With me, he'd grab a football, right? Instead of saying like, Father, I could use some of your wisdom now. They're not going to do that. But when he held up the football, then it was like, okay, I know my son needs me. And now, watch, I like the nonverbal. I like going outside when you can. You can't always do that, but I like it because fresh air. Now, it gives me a little bit of movement of the fa as the father. Why? Because I need to calm down because I want to wring his little neck right now. Now he comes outside. We can play catch, right? I can throw the little ball a little bit hard at his face, just a little passive aggressive, but, right? And he doesn't know. And I'm like, hey, go deep, button hook. Hey, good catch. And in the process of doing that, I'm calming down. He's calming down, right? Now, here's a huge thing that I want us to see. It's massive. That sounds dumb. It's not massive. It's huge, though. It's hugely important. I'm now together with my son. Typically, you know what? Go to your room right now. Nothing wrong with that, except inadvertently, I just sent my son away from the very person who has the wisdom to help him. Does that make sense? But if I'm building with Legos on the floor, or coloring, or building something, because some of your, many of your kids are good at building stuff, they're very tactile. So use that to your advantage. And I'm playing catch with them. Watch the message that I'm sending to my son. When your world is out of control, mine's not. I can handle you at your worst. Think about how God handles us when we're having bad days. Is he like, you know what, you need to go to your room, get your attitude together, and then come talk to me respectfully. No, he says, in that moment when you're most out of control, when you're most distraught, when you're most feeling, come to me boldly. And I want your kids, 
when they're four and eight and 13 and in their teen years especially, when they're going through rough times, I want them coming to you, not posting stuff on Facebook and not going to their teenage friends because their teenage friends have horrible advice. But if every time they come to you, you're going to do this thing, you know, how many times have I told you not to do that? Right? They're not going to come to you. <sighs> what? what? Right? That sends them away. I want them to know when something's going wrong and you're facing the toughest stuff, I'm the safe place because I can control myself. And when your world's out of control, my, does that make sense? It's a cool thing. Look, there are hundreds of examples of how you calm them and, and, and draw them in, but I like an activity because it tends to be better than, hey, we need to talk about your emotions. Most people don't like doing that. So let me do this. Oh, so anyway, let's do a quick little discipline thing here, finish up this story. So now Christian and I are outside, and we're playing catch, and we're both calmed down. Now I can get to the discipline. Discipline means to teach. I like these phrases. So Christian, that thing back inside where you're yelling at your mom, a couple things I know. I know that you know yelling at your mother, not happening in our home, inappropriate. I like that phrase, and I know it sounds kind of stupid, but try it with your kids. I know you know that's wrong, because here's the opposite in what we usually do. What were you thinking? How many times do I have to tell you? If you think about those phrases literally mean you are an idiot, right? How many times do I have to tell you? You're so stupid, right? We, but out of our frustration, I know you know that's wrong. Look, here's the thing with discipline. Your kids already know that what they did is wrong from a young age. How many of you have kids who lie about stuff? Good. Lying shows that they have a conscience. For most of your strong-willed kids, it's not an integrity issue, so don't get freaked out. Here's what it is. I have impulse control issues. I've got an agenda. I want to get stuff done, and I just do stuff. And then I realize, uh-oh, I'm going to be in trouble. Well, they should just fess up to it. Who does? You don't and I don't. We make up all kinds of stuff. Adam, who ate from the tree? She made me do it. <laughs> right? It's human nature. So the, the key to that lying is not to get, it's not an integrity issue most of the time. It's the fact that we have to teach them and show them how to be successful and how to make good choices instead of stop doing that or else. That literally usually doesn't work that well. And it's not the best motivation. So anyway, so um, where was I? Thank you. You were like the teacher's pet. Don't you feel good? So she's like, I don't care. That's why my daughter has a bad attitude too. So anyway. <laughs> so look, I know you know that's wrong. I also know that you know when you yell at your mother, hit your sister, lie, it always brings dire consequences. And yet you did it anyway. So I'm curious. I love the phrase, I'm curious. It is a phenomenal phrase, a conversation builder. Look, you and Paul, if you're not wise enough to discuss politics with other people of the opposing faith, right, it devolves, right? Well, why would you believe that? Clearly you hate America, right? That's not really constructive. But if I am meeting someone and they have a totally different point of view and I say, look, I, my worldview is a little bit different. I'm curious. What in your experience has led you to that viewpoint? They're going to open up and tell me, just saying like, well, why would you believe that? Right? Shuts it down. I'm curious with your spouse. I'm, look, see if this makes sense. Sorry if this messes up the film thing. Typical discipline is this becomes me against you, right? Like, how, how many times do I have to tell you, it's me against you, and I need you to get to behave? When I say I'm curious, it's like I'm coming alongside my son, and I'm a resource for you. And I'm saying, look, the stuff that you're doing, it doesn't hurt me. It's not hurting your mom, okay? It's hurting you. You're losing your stuff, so I'm curious. If you know what's wrong, and since you know that you're going to lose all your stuff, what else is going on? Now, do you always have to do that? No. And tomorrow we'll do a whole bunch of range of different discipline stuff because it's not all about talking like, what was the root of that? Because most of the root of it is, uh, I just didn't want to do what you wanted me to do, right? Or the tantrum was, I wanted the fruit snacks and you said no. Ah, 
<laughs> so it's not like, I'm curious, what's going on? You don't have to use it all the time, but in emotional situations, I want to figure it out. So what I heard from my son was, often was, well, Dad, I held it together all day at school, but then when I came home, how many of your kids do that? And then when they come home, they unload on someone. So I said, okay, I get that. So two things. I know that you, I also know you know the right thing to do now, which is go apologize to your mom. He knew. Grab your backpack. We're going to go out through the front door, and I'm going to show you three different ways to deal with your frustration so that tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day when you come home frustrated at school, because you're always going to be frustrated at school, because I know it feels like jail to you, right? Because many of your kids, that's how it feels. Instead of coming home every day and taking out on mom, I'll show you how to deal with that. See, I just taught him something, right? So a couple quick things uh, for those of you with, uh, with kids like this after school. If your kids don't like school, don't ask them, how was your day? How was your day at that place where you're on red on the behavior chart and don't have any friends? How is it today? <laughs> right? Also, watch, because they feel pressure all the time. Hey, how'd you do? How, how'd you do on that test? Because, and watch all the parental anxiety. I, I, I need you to know that you did well on the test so that you graduate, so you get a good grade, so you graduate next year, so you're going to graduate, and so you can go to college, so that you can get a job, and so you can get a spouse. And that's all tied up sometimes in this whole thing, and it's too much pressure. So for younger kids, treasure hunt after school. Hey, hid something in the backyard, bet you can't find it in the next seven and a half minutes. This is a good one. Say dad's home, mom's on the way home from work. Hey, why don't we hide something in the basement when mom gets home? Let's see if she can find it. Kids love stumping their parents, and it gives them something they're in control of because at school, they're not in control of anything. For older kids, your middle school, high school kids, here's your conversation. Look, here's a typical conversation. Hey, how was school today? Fine. Got any homework? Nope. Okay, guess I'll talk to you tomorrow, right? <laughs> but if you do this one after school, hey, something happened to me today. Tell them a story. Something happened to you today at the office, at the post office, the grocery store. And I'm curious, what would you do if you were in my situation? See, at school all day, they're being told what to do all day long and regurgitate. And now I just ask you for your opinion, and they'll open up. And once they open up, then you can get into other stuff. Does that make sense? One more for your teens. Next time they tell you something important, don't jump down their throat with a lecture. Oh, that reminds me of lecture 46B as a parent on how to choose good friends, right? <laughs> Try this. It's really cool. Instead, say this. Hey, I appreciate you sharing that with me. Listen, I've got to go get started on dinner. If you want to come grab me later, I'd love to share some of my thoughts with you about that. And I'm walking away so that they eventually come to you. Now, here's your warning. They're going to come to you. Okay, Mom, what are your stupid ideas? <laughs> and for some of your kids, that's borderline respectful, right? You're going to be like, not bad for you. And then you share, but they came with their hearts open to you. Does that make sense? So what we're going to do um, uh, uh, tomorrow, yes, sir, did you need something? Okay, we can do that tomorrow. Okay, hold on just a second. I just want to look because I've got eight minutes. I've got seven minutes and 54 seconds, 53, 52. <laughs> I'm a little bit oppositional, so I'm going to go a little bit over. No, I won't. Are your kids in child care here? Oh, good. How many of you aren't even going home tonight? <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. How many of you told the babysitter? Do what? <laughs> I have a question. Does pastor preach too long, or is he pretty good? Perfect. <laughs> you know what I get on my pastor about? He'll, like, preach the whole time. Sorry if this offends you. And then the prayer at the end is basically a regurgitation of his lecture, of his sermon, right? You know those ones? God, help us to remember points one, two, three, four, and five. I'm like, just say like, God bless us. We heard us, then we're out of there, right? Because I leave early from church. I don't need to hear the prayer. I already heard your long sermon. So, especially with a crowded parking lot like this, forget it. So... Half the people are like, I don't think he's really a Christian. So we get that at homeschool conventions. They come up and ask, is your dad really a Christian? And he'll be like, obviously not your kind. Anyway, 
he had a guy in Cincinnati. He was 17, six foot four. So does your dad still spank you? And my son was like, look at me. <laughs> like I'm six foot four and no, two, what, six foot two, whatever he is, he just looks tall. So we couldn't, it was too hard holding him down from a young age. How many of you did that, right? I'm supposed to do this calmly and he's wriggling around. And then I realized it just didn't work with the strong will kids. So we did it a different way and I'll share that tomorrow. So anyway, uh, I just don't want, anyway, I hate doing this spanking thing because people are like, oh, it's scripture. And I'm like, okay, well then you've got to start beating uh, grown adults who are fools because stripes for the right for the backs of fools. You want to go scripture? I can go hardcore law all day long. I love the law. It makes me feel all kinds of proud and awesome, right? <laughs> when, I, when I post stuff on our Facebook page that's very tough parenting, I get like 400 likes. People love that. When I do something about like learn about your kids and be curious, it's like crickets, <laughs> right? Because people love the law. It feels very comfortable. Yep, you're the authority figure. By the way, remind me to hit on that. We've got this idea in the church somewhere, and it came in through the church, and it's not healthy of like, well, I'm the authority figure. People love that. You're the authority figure. And we got this thing that the authority figure is supposed to boss other people around. The authority figure is the one who serves. Jesus is the ultimate authority figure, and he got on his knees, and he washed people's feet. And when they brought... I did this at the, uh, uh, this uh, Johnson County Mental Health Services thing. I told, uh, it's a non-Christian thingy, but I told the story because I think Jesus was kind of the first social worker when they bring the woman caught in adultery to him. And watch, it's very instructive. You know what we would have done? What were you thinking, you little, right? True? Christians are most judgmental people, are we not? Why do you think people don't want to be Christians half the time? It's all, look, own this stuff. I work half the time with Christians, half not. Part, half of it is like, I don't want to be with those people. And, I, and I'm sorry we do that. That's partly us. It's not like, oh, they're persecuting us because we're Christians. Part is that, no, they're persecuting us because we're just horrible people sometimes. And we don't act like Jesus. True? I'm not saying you do. It's all the other churches. But, <laughs> but it's true, right? And so Jesus, instead of lecturing her, gets down and starts drawing in the dirt because he's averting his eyes from her shame, right? It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But I just encourage you, I, we will do tomorrow with discipline. I'm firmly in the camp of I'm the authority figure in the home. But that means I serve. In the first part of my marriage, I was, you know what my mother-in-law told me and told her, my wife? Honey, you better take care of that man or someone else will. It's a horrible thing. Seriously. I mean, it was great for me and early in the marriage. I was like, yeah, listen to your mom. Give me something to eat. Right? But we've got it wrong in the church because, look, I'm the one who has the, like, the, there's another one of the scriptures. Wives, submit to your husbands. The men have the harder part. Lay down your life for your wife the way Jesus did for the church. I have the harder part. When I lay down my life for my wife, it'll be really easy for her to trust me because I first laid down my life for her. And when my kids see me laying down my life and handling things with grace and mercy and patiently, they'll listen to me, not because I'm your father, but because I'm a dad you can trust. Does that make sense? And that's where we're going to go kind of tomorrow because it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> 